Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 157 of the Effort Report. I'm Elizabeth Matsui. I'm here with Roger Peng. And we have a big episode because I get to talk about my first in-person conference. Oh, uh, yeah. It's a, it's a big day. It is a big day. Also, I, I'm in the office right now, which is an unusual occurrence. <laughs> all the, I'm afraid to say all these things are a good sign because I may jinx it. But, you know, it's starting to feel different. Things are trending, you feel like. Yes. Well, it's kind of like when the p-value is like 0. 0.06, you know, and you're like, things are trending towards significance. It's approaching significance. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. That, probably one of your favorite things to see in a paper or talk. <laughs> trending significant. Yes. So should we dive into work in progress? Sure. I think these are mostly mine. Is that right? Yeah. I have one that's embedded in the middle there. So so I uh, I saw this tweet come by. And it is from someone I follow. Her name is Heidi Zabold, I think. Zabold. Um, and she wrote, as grant reviewers, do you care about the diversity of teams? E.g., do you downgrade teams if they are only men? So I wanted to bring this up because I thought it was an interesting kind of question. And I think um, the answer is not as simple as it sounds. Um, and so I think the so there's like a couple answers. One is like, do I care about the diversity of teams? Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> I mean, as a general matter, right? Right. Um, however, in terms of like downgrading grants for, uh, you know, for the composition of their investigator team, that is, um, this is a tricky one because I think, um, you know, I've seen people do this um, and it's, I think it's not, I think you're allowed to do it, right? I mean, I think... Um, you don't you can score things the way you f see fit but correct me if i'm wrong on that um <laughs> as I'm I, I think it. you can but i'm not aware of it would, it would be interesting to actually pull up the exact nih and i'm looking talking about this through the nih sort of you know investigator and reviewer lens yeah about how they might describe that investigator section because I'm not aware that there's any specific language that sort of refer, you know, incorporates diversity of the investigator team. Well, yes, yeah, so, so that's what I'm trying to get at. So I don't think there's any specific prohibition. There might be, but I can't recall if there's like a prohibition, right? Um, but the one issue that I think is, confounds this problem is that there's usually, at least the grants that I've read, um, there's very little very little direct information about the investigators themselves right like so you see their bio sketches and you know what papers they published and there's like professional information um but there's very little information typically about the investigators and so if you were to kind of make a judgment about what the composition of the investigator team was um you would for the most part have to make assumptions about their names and maybe if you bothered to google them assumptions about like their websites like that come from their websites right right and uh that can cut a number of different ways <laughs> and uh i've kind of been on both sides of this as a reviewer and probably as a, and as a re investigator um because i was on an on an i did submit a grant with the large investigator team and some of the reviewers or one of the reviewer i should say you know kind of made an assumption about the racial composition of our team um mm -hmm. that was incorrect um and so and then doubt but like kind of dinged us for that right 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 and, uh, and we tried to kind of argue this back to the program office but it was kind of it didn't it didn't go it didn't fly basically um and so you know i think the the, the ideal solution to this is for the nih to say like to create a policy or to create a review schema that incorporates these factors right um but because then you'd have presumably the investigators would have to provide information about the composition of the team Right. And then you would have objective kind of like, well, you'd have actual information, I should say, um, as opposed to making assumptions about kind of various factors that you see in the grant. I think that's the problem, I think so. Right. And um, I was involved in one application where and, and it was a disparities grant where we had a section in the grant and we were very deliberate about describing the diversity of the investigator team. The, the other thing that I should comment on is that 
there might, might be a reason why reviewers would be paying more attention to that depending on the kind of mechanism you know or theme of the rfa that you're applying to and this was specifically a disparities grant and we didn't get the grant funded at all but we got kudos in you know the review comments about the diversity of the team and again i don't there's nothing that disallows that but I don't think, I don't recall whether there was anything in the RFA that talked about that specifically. Um, but unless you provided that information, you know, there'd be no way for people to kind of assess it um, if, if, if it was important for the mechanism or otherwise. I believe my recollection is that some RFAs do ask, specifically ask for that kind of information, especially for the PI, like if the PI needs to satisfy certain requirements, um, then you have to kind of provide that information. Uh, but that's kind of on a case by case basis. It's not a general phenomenon uh, across all NIH grants. Right, right. No, I think this is an important topic because, for obvious reasons, it's an important topic. But it's interesting that it has not been tackled by NIH in any kind of explicit way. And it would not have occurred to me, even though I think it's important to be honest, it would not have occurred to me to have highlighted that in other grants that I submit that are not, you know, specific to um, a mechanism that is not just focused on health disparities, but part of the grant that I'm talking about that we wrote had like educational components and other sorts of components along with it. So it, it was more obvious and explicit that the study section may care about those things. And it's obvious that those things are important as well. Um, but from a strategy standpoint, it felt like it was more important to put in the grant, but maybe maybe it's important to put in all grants to be explicit about it. I don't know, that's an interesting question. Like, would you, would you include that information in future grants? I, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I guess uh, I've never, I mean, I've never done it in a when I've written like statistics grants. Right, right. Often because the, <laughs> the investigator team is essentially me. Um, <laughs> An N of one. Yeah, but um, but I think it would not surprise me going forward at some point, especially when the if the you know when a new NIH director is announced, it would not surprise me if such a kind of an, a requirement is added. Um, to NIH grants. The other thing I wanted to say is that um, I don't know how NSF grants work um, in terms of this thing, but it would not surprise me if they did something like this just because um, they have so many other kinds of requirements <laughs> that are along these lines. So, um, But I don't know. So maybe someone else knows out there knows if NSF has some thing like this for investigator teams. There are, aside from investigator teams, there are special considerations for and I think the term that's used is like minority serving institutions um, so that certain RFAs are directed in that direction or um, there are different amounts of money. So there's like, you know, an RFA may have more funds or sort of a kind of wrinkle or special con special consideration in other ways. And UT, by the way, is considered a Hispanic serving institution. So I've, th so I've learned that this, aspect of NIH funding exists since coming here. You too may take advantage of that. Okay. Uh, want to move on? Yes. The corporatization of committees. What does that mean? I know. This was sort of fascinating to me, which is that I hadn't thought of it this way. You know how sometimes, well, there's a range of sort of committees. There are, and I'm not even sure I would call this a committee, but there's kind of a grassroots informal gathering of people who, you know, have similar maybe roles and shared interests and they're trying to solve a problem, but it's grassroots. Okay. Um, and then that can turn into like, oh, well, maybe in order for us to actually affect change, we need to kind of formally organize ourselves and be recognized. And then depending on how you define success, this may be considered successful that structure you've built becomes like embedded in the organization structure so that and that's the corporatization of the committee. So the example that I will give is that when I first arrived here, I was um, a role that I had was the associate chair of research for our department. 
and there was not very much sort of org structure or infrastructure related to research. And so I reached out to some other associate chairs of research and said, you know, we should put our heads together to figure out how to promote research. And so we started meeting informally and it, you know, was like a monthly meeting and it was more for us to sort of vent about things and share information and figure out how, you know, maybe we could help each other and advance research. And then eventually we became, as a part of our job, we became advisory um, to the vice dean of research. And so we were more formalized, except for the fact that we still had, um, so we had to kind of be more structured in like who was the committee member. And there was a part of our meeting that was set aside to meet with the vice dean of research, but the other part of the meeting was still had an agenda, which it didn't have before, but it was really an agenda driven by the group. Um, and then eventually the org structure in, in the dean's office changed again. And so the vice dean of research took the meeting kind of over and set the agenda for the meeting. And it became much more one of those meetings where there's a PowerPoint prepared and that the PowerPoint's presented to the committee is, so it becomes like information that's shared from one direction to the other and some feedback, but it gets over time, it morphs into something that is entirely under control of the riffraff. We were the riffraff, right? Yep. Yep. And then the amount of control um, that the sort of, you know, the dean's office or the higher leadership level of the entity has increases over time until there's complete control over it. And the riffraff no longer, you know, have minimal control. Right. So that's the corporatization of committees. Got it. So now you have a box on the org chart for the committee. Yes. Yes. And it goes beyond that, like over time. And, and so while, and, and I've seen this happen, like in, you know, outside of academia, like in professional societies where like a group bands together because of some common issue. So they kind of meet informally and maybe they are meeting, you know, it starts out that they're meeting, I don't know, at a, at a bar after the day long meeting and word of mouth travels. And so everyone's having a good time networking. And then maybe the next year, they ask the organization to support it. The organization scrapes together some money. So maybe there's like a designated time with like one of the conference rooms set aside. Right. And yeah. then suddenly it becomes, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, and so that could be seen as highly successful, but it becomes much less fun <laughs> as it gets more and more corporatized. Well, I, you know, the only thing I have to say for you is, you know, first of all, congratulations. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> And this reminds me of that that old saying, which is, you know, doesn't come from anywhere, I don't think. But it's like, you know, one day your work will be recognized by the government. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a corporate version of that, I should say. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Full credit to my husband who came up with that term. So he would refer to some committee meetings as the corporate blah, blah, blah meeting. Yeah. And then there was like the, the, the just the blah, blah, blah meeting. But the corporate version of it was like full-on PowerPoint, highly structured agenda, um, highly locked down. So in some ways it's successful, but in some ways it's sad. Well, you know, every, you know, the, there's kind of like a transition between when uh, I think a committee like this goes from like being able to get anything done to like not getting anything done at all. <laughs> right. And I think like once it's completely corporatized, it's like, okay, well now you know that nothing ever happens actually in the meeting. Right. Yes. That that's actually a good point. There's like this sweet pot. Like if, if, if the goal is to affect change and not just to have fun, there's this sweet spot between like, you know, the rabble rouser sort of informal gathering and the full corporatization of the committee. So the, so both of these examples I'm talking about have been fully corporatized now. So, and what, in my experience, what happens is that after the corporatization occurs, there's like a separate subcommittee uh, <laughs> that like meets on the side, right? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> and that's like where actual decisions get made. <laughs> 
And and I, I mean, it's funny you should say that, but yes, that is actually what's going on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it almost has to go on, right? Because the actual meetings are like a waste of time. Not a waste of time, but they're very right. kind of choreographed in some sense. Right, right. Yeah. Anyway, I thought you'd enjoy that one. I did enjoy it, yes. So maybe that should be the title of this episode. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, last little bit of follow-up I have is from last time we talked about creating a crisis in order to get things done. Uh-huh. And I can't believe I didn't think about this while we were talking about it, but um, I was thinking that like that's all of social media, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's just people trying to create a crisis to like get attention for their thing, right? And uh, it's like there's a saying that's like, you know, there's the uh, – I mean, I, well, I don't know if the, what, what, what the saying goes I was thinking of, but I think like – it, I think social media kind of like because it kind of focuses everyone's attention on one place, right? There's a competition for like who gets the attention for that, you know, for everyone on the network, right? Right, right. Um, and so the more – and the same for true for news organizations. That's where clickbait comes from, you know. And it's like you have to create a crisis to um, to get, get the eyeballs. Right. Well, and I've often wondered whether there's a boomerang effect because – like there's only so much volume and crisis you can create. And then, you know, it's like the boy who cried wolf. I don't know. I think we're testing that right now. Like, I mean, it's a, it's a world ways. society wide to test. of the... Yes. That's an excellent point. So if you want to learn how to, how to use this tool to get things done, you know, maybe you should get onto Twitter and start screaming. Well, there's also a corollary, which is that sometimes you can create a crisis, not on social media, by using social media, right? Uh-huh. So it can be as a tool uh, as opposed to just kind of being on social media completely. Right, right. Now, that's actually a good point. Yeah. It's, yeah. Pet peeves? Uh, it's all you. So this is related to coming back from the Quad AI meeting. And this is really a trivial pet peeve. But you know how, like, you know, there's often like a if it's not like a Q&A panel, there's like a series of speakers and they come up one at a time and give their talks. Yeah. And and sometimes all of the speakers could sort of sit down kind of in one of the first rows and listen to each other's talks. And then they come up to the dais one at a time to give their talks. Right. And right. then maybe they all assemble at the end for Q&A. Sure. And then another thing is to have all the speakers sitting on the dais from the very beginning. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> Okay, now I understand what this means. <laughs> I do not like that. Cuz yeah, oh yeah, that's the worst. You're like on display, right? Yeah, you're just like sitting there twiddling your fingers, but like everyone's watching. <laughs> yes, yes. And so this happened to me. Uh, you know, one of the moderators and I was trying to be very accommodating. Um, and the funny thing is is I was there were three speakers and I was with one of the other speakers and the moderator said we were like, oh, well, do you want us to sit up there? Or do you, we can sit down here. And the moderator said, oh, no, what, why don't you sit up here? And the other speaker was like, well, I don't think we can really see the slides of the other, which oh, is good point. sort of pushing it. Yes. And then the moderator was like, moderator was like oh, no, no, they've set up a, a screen here. So you'll be able to see the slides from the dance. And Dang. Was like, <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. What, what, it's like, what's the point, though? Like, wh why do... I don't understand, like, what's... Unless it's, like, there's nowhere else to sit. There's literally nowhere else to sit. Well, let me tell you, there's, that was not the case. <laughs> I mean, what's the point of having people on display? I, it's just, it just doesn't make sense to me. Right. I don't I don't know either, and, and I don't like it because then... I mean, I'm not sure that I'm behaving any differently, but it is. Like, you're sitting up there on, there on display. I understand. You, know, you need to come back up there for the Q&A or what have you, but... Yeah. But then you're being active, you know. Right, right. Well, we're going to talk more about your experience at this meeting uh, a little bit later. Yeah, I'm amazed that you that you, like you immediately knew what I was talking about. Well, I, I I was like I wasn't sure when I saw it on the outline, but then as you were mentioning, I'm like uh, I just had this feeling of dread like build in, build up inside me. Yeah. See, <laughs> has that ever happened to you? Uh, yeah, it's happened. I mean, uh, yeah, it's worse when it's like when you're like really elevated, you know. <laughs> Like on right, stage right. or something, you know? Yes. All right. Rogers Leadership Academy. That's right. What leadership lessons do you have to offer in my academy? Well, you know, before we started recording, we had like 10 here. <laughs> That's we had true. To... We had to winnow it down. 
the hits keep coming. So we talked about, I can't remember if it was the last episode or the episode before that about how, you know, you could use a crisis, as you mentioned in the work in progress segment, you could use a crisis to get something done. Now, leaders should be adept at using a crisis to avoid dealing with something or someone you don't want to deal with. Ah, the other side of the coin. The other side of the coin, right? I'm so sorry the animal facility is on fire. So I'm, I'm totally making that up. So, you know, I've been tied up in that because now there's like replacing the animals and the insurance and the animal care committee and this, that, and the other. And, you know. So therefore we can't meet for another six months. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. That's why I haven't gotten back in touch with you. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. I'm trying to think if I've ever had that used on me. You just, you know, if it's used well, you don't really realize it's being used. Fair enough. Yeah. (laughs) Well, that's true for all leadership, right? Yes. (laughs) Like the leaded should not feel like they're being leaded. Yes. Right? (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure it's been used on you. It's just that you actually believed that the, like, like there's a real crisis and then there's manufacturing a crisis. Of the course. Really yes. adept leaders just, you know, they're good at manufacturing a crisis. But there's no way to tell the difference. Right. Yeah. Okay. I accept that. But I just, I can't even remember the last time a, a crisis occurred. I mean, besides like the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic is a good one, to be honest. Yes. Well, that wasn't manufactured though. <laughs> as far as we know. Is it right. Well, there's that. <laughs> Um, but I can't remember the last time someone uh, used a crisis on me. But I'm sure it's happened. I just my memory is failing. Not the, you know, that's all. Yeah. All right. So the other one is, you come across as being responsive, but you are responsive in a way that leaves a door wide open for you to actually ignore the whole issue. <laughs> oh, <this is> so good. <laughs> <laughs> and. This is, you know, an example of this kind of um, response might be like, oh, thank you for bringing this up. This is so important. I'll add it to my list. Done. At list added. Yes. Yes. (laughs) I mean, that's a concrete action that I think any leader would be willing to take. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And not only that, like, there's not really like a list that anyone could ever Right, it's not posted anywhere. <laughs> right, it's just a metaphorical list. What's the? Uh, is there a way to? Uh, is there a defense against this particular tactic? That's tough because the because of the power structure. I think, like you yourself, could then you know put a reminder on your calendar. Like you could try to remind the person, or also pin them down. So let's say that's an email exchange. You could, if you were the um, leaded, you could reply to the leader and say, oh, this is terrific. I'll, I'll schedule a follow-up meeting with you. Right. Yeah. I mean, you could do stuff that, but it, that doesn't help Just sort of like, oh, let me know what the next steps are or how I can help. Like that doesn't paint the person into a corner, but right. like it's easily ignored. Yeah. Yeah. You, and if you're afraid to say, I'll schedule a follow-up because of the power differential, you could say, when should I have my, you know, when should I reach out for a follow-up meeting? Uh, yeah. Okay. I was thinking that um, you could also start talking to other people about it, you know, what, depending on what the nature of the matter is. Like if it's a personal thing, then maybe not. But Ah, so this is, you're going to create a committee that's, this is like the pre-corporatization. That would be this. Yeah. So that would be the way to thwart this. <laughs> If, if, if thwarting was needed, (laughs) if the leader needed to thwart this, but I think there's a one strategy, it would be to kind of get a sense that like the issue is perhaps getting out of the leader's control. Right. Right. Um, And, and then forcing some sort of decision to be made. So if other people were kind of in on this issue and being informed and kind of like, you know, and momentum was gathering, then um, the, leader might be forced to, you know, corporatize the committee. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Look so, at that. <laughs> so we got a little leadership and a little like uh, a defense against the dark arts there. So Right, right, right. I should have put the corporatization of committees under the, your leadership academy. That's true. It's I mean it's uh it's a classic <laughs> mo- maneuver. Yeah, it's everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good thing good thing we trimmed the 10 down to 2. 
Yeah. Well, we got to save some content for future episodes, right? Right. Lessons from space. We have returned with lessons from space. This one is, uh, as the, I guess, as they all are, a little bit kind of oblique. <laughs> but uh, I just finished reading this book. Uh, the book is called Digital Apollo, and it's about it's about this. It's written by this guy who's like a historian at MIT, and uh, and MIT is significant because they developed the computer that flew on the Apollo spacecraft on all the lunar missions, and it was like the one of the early, first digital computers. Uh, that used like integrated circuits, all the stuff that you know we use nowadays, um, and uh, so it was kind of a significant milestone. Anyway, so this book is, uh, was about the history of that development, um, and it was kind of an interesting story about like the role of humans in space travel, uh, because that had never been defined before, obviously. And so there was a question of like, well, kind of who's in charge, right? Um, and there, and there was some thinking that like, well, the computer should be in charge because this flying a spacecraft is so complicated right and humans don't have the kinds of reactions that they need to avert danger right uh but all of the astronauts initially were test pilots um and so they wanted to be and they were kind of their feeling was that they should always be in control right and so there was a whole there was a constant back and forth over who would control what and or and it was and the and the kind of the, from the point of view of the designers it was kind of the computer designers it was kind of like how do we give the astronauts a feeling a feeling that they're in control, even if they're not actually in control. Ah, right? if you're managing the human sort of ego, right? Yes, but I think looking at this kind of historical development of like you know initially in aviation, pilots were in control; they flew the plane, right? But then as you moved into space, it became too complicated. Look, the system that they're managing is so complicated that there's no way for one person or even two people to kind of understand everything that everything that's going on, right? And to control everything that needs to be controlled to make things successful. And it kind of made me think about like the kind of evolution of science, really. I think as we go, you know, this kind of like the natural, the kind of his model of like the PI or the investigator kind of doing everything, uh, you know, running the experiments, collecting their data and then doing their little t-test and publishing the paper. And, you know, and that's kind of how science works. Um, and, uh, and, and to like now kind of we have like these kind of computational types of research uh, where we have these like huge kind of systems like collecting data, processing data, and there's super multidisciplinary teams to understand the, you know, the scientific kind of background, and and we have, and I think one of the things that's I think now this is going to sound a bit of a stretch, but I do think that the computer again is at the center, but then also it's like the person who controls the computer is kind of at the center, which is often like someone who's analyzing the data or, you know, or understands all the data, I should say. I don't know what do you think about that. <laughs> so, so, so the take-home message here is that computers are becoming more and more central, but at the end of the day, there's still a human that's controlling the 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 the, the computational piece. But it is a different human than traditionally controlled. Okay, the research, I, I got, right? I got it. Yes. And um, I think the other thing I would say is that like scientific investigation for the most part now is is quite a complex system right with many different parts that are integrated uh like together to produce whatever the results are and um and that makes it harder i think just because of the complexity um to manage right and i think and th so the other part of this kind of history in the in the book was kind of like how people how the management of pro how they had to invent a way to manage large projects um because they didn't exist and now they have like you know they have, there's like the rocket, there's the computer, there's the astronauts, there's like the life support. There's all these different systems that are integrated together. Uh, and they had to have a system to manage the development of all those things in parallel and to know which ones are late, which ones are on time, and which ones are ahead of schedule. And So they have, you know, they developed, developed all these like systems engineering techniques that they kind of brought from the Air Force. Um, and uh, it's, so it just, I, I felt like there was, there was a parallel there in terms of the way that science now is done, I think maybe compared to how it had been done in the past. I have seen that just in kind of my career and yet my senses, but maybe I'm like, you know, been left out of some key piece of knowledge along the way. But my senses is that in, in the scientific endeavor in the biomedical world, we've just sort of 
each individual PI has had to figure out themselves how to integrate everything and how to set up quality assurance and quality control uh, processes, how to like make sure all the pieces which are highly diverse in terms of like the language they that that you know an expert in an area uses and the tools they use like figuring out how to link all of those things just for people to understand and communicate and how the system needs to be built and then on top of that how to execute or launch the system and monitor it along the way is a ginormous undertaking and you you're not and for me personally, I mean, I don't have massive, massive data sets, but I have a fairly complicated, my research program in terms of like the number of moving parts and the disciplines that are around the table has become more complicated over time. And I've just sort of had to make up, make it up as I go, you know, how to ensure that all of that works together. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's, you know, one of the things that the that I got the last thing I got from this book was that you know the pilots would always deride the kind of the quote unquote the systems men you know uh, and they're systems men they're never any well, systems I mean, women well the pilots were for sure all men right and, uh, that's true and the the leadership at least in NASA where the systems people were kind of they were all were men. men yeah yeah uh, there were women kind of led the lower levels at the kind of the computing level but mm-hmm. um, but not in the leadership and so um, it's. And I think there's an analogy to it because I think, you know, when you think about like uh, I work a lot in kind of this area of reproducibility and there's a lot of um, discussion about like processes and kind of, aud- you know, making data analyses auditable and, you know, and tracking the data and their sources. And, uh, and and I think I get a similar level of derision from like some investigators. It's, you know, it's like, ah, that stuff's all a waste of time, you know. Um, and uh, so, anyway, I so I just think it, the thing the, the thing that's that they have in, that these two stories have in common is kind of like the focus on process, essentially, uh, which can be you know feel it can feel very bureaucratic at times, uh, but on the other hand, um, the complexity of the kind of endeavor sometimes demands it. Right, right. Um, I will say that I ha- have developed like this enormous appreciation for people who are really good thinkers about process. Um, when, um, you know, I had a person join my team who had like, who's especially talented at thinking this way and had a lot of experience, um, in pharma trials, you know, where they thought a lot about process of, of primary data collection type studies that like seeing someone do that, like that was not a part of my formal education ever, um, in terms of doing, you know, launching a study and, I learned a ton from her and I think that was sort of the first generation of thinking about that. But now that I also hear you talking about it in terms of research reproducibility and sort of integrating it with kind of my more recent experience since I've moved here where like the diversity of skills and the people that I collaborate with in terms of like how how to get people talking together and get ideas from disparate fields to kind of connect and then have it become sort of a concrete proposal on paper. Like that's another sort of level of that. That's a conceptual level of that, that is also not taught anywhere, but I think is a skill that is, I mean, I think this is what you're getting at is that's becoming increasingly important to have in, in scientific endeavors and that kind of program cannot be run by a robot not not yet at least <laughs> yeah not yet at least yeah <laughs> yeah so anyway there's my lesson from space there's your lesson so should we go into main topics let's do it do we want to start with the quad ai meeting follow-up i do because i'm desperate to hear about how your meeting went. We've been li- letting the listeners have been waiting for for like a number of episodes now because we've teased it, you know. Yes, and I saw someone at the Quad AI meeting who said, and someone tweeted this too that we covered. Kimberly uh, Blumenthal tweeted about this a few weeks ago, but I saw another person at the meeting who was like, "Oh, I was so 
relieved to hear you talk about, you know, your angst about going to the meeting because I was feeling that way too. And um, so anyway, it, uh, first of all, normally the meeting, you know, I'll leave on a Thursday and then I will typically fly back on Monday. The meeting runs from Friday through Monday. Um, this time um, I got there on Friday evening and I flew back on a Sunday afternoon. So I'm just sort of trying to lay out sort of the scenario. Um, but I was super busy during that time. I had moderated two sessions, gave two talks in two different sessions, had like four committee meetings. So, and that was, none of that stuff started until Saturday. And then my last thing was Monday ended, I mean, ended Sunday at noon and then I left for the airport. So um, it was really good, but I was utterly exhausted. So we're recording this, like I got back home last night or yesterday evening, and now we're recording it the next day. And I think I went to bed at like 9.30 uh -huh. slept until seven. <laughs> uh, and normally I'm exhausted from that meeting, but normally I'm there for a much longer period of time. Yeah. And, and I'm out later at night than I was. And so it was just, it was utterly exhausting, but it was really great to see people. One of the nice things is it was in Phoenix. So the weather was warm, you know, is, is warmer there um, and so we could still have, you know, informal gatherings and we gathered at this like food truck court, like, you know, the group of people that I socialize with. And it was really nice because people could come and go and get their own food and it was outdoors and people were really great about navigating other people's um, sort of comfort about um, COVID or whatever, like, oh, can I give you a hug or not? Right. And in fact, the um, meeting, I don't know. I mean, this was. I think this was very well intended, but so the meeting handed out colored wristbands and I think other meetings have, I've heard maybe have done something like this. And so you could take either a red, yellow or green wristband and it was a way to communicate to others how comfortable you were with like people, how close they got to you or whether they oh, shook your hands or whatever. Okay. And so a green one meant, you know, you were... To hell with COVID. No. <laughs> I was going to say, what, what's the definition of green? <laughs> well, like, you know, you could, you know, business as usual. Right. And I've forgotten what yellow was. I think they had some sort of, you know, guidelines around that. And then, I don't know, red. I didn't, I saw some, I saw generally people having yellow or green ones on. I picked a green one. People were great. And you had to show proof of vaccination. To go to the meeting. Yep. Which was awesome. Um, you know, these are all people in healthcare and people's mask game was awesome. People tended to have, you know, higher grade masks that they were wearing, um, by and large, you know, like KN95s and that sort of thing. Um, so the other thing, so the social aspect was really nice. I saw people I hadn't seen in several years. Our last in-person meeting was in 2019 because, in 2020, our meeting was like something like March 15th or March 13th. And right. So it literally got totally canceled, like within days of it launching. One thing that was fascinating is that many people who would otherwise have normally recognized me did not recognize me. Ah, okay. Yes. Much has changed. Well, so my hair is longer. It's gray. It's not entirely gray yet, but it has a lot more gray in it. And you're wearing a mask. Yes. And these are not the people who, you know, I've been interacting with otherwise during the pandemic. These are people that you see at the meeting, and but they're yeah. very familiar with who I am, right? Like they're people. Yeah, that... but there's like a population of people that you kind of only see at meetings. Yes. Right? Yeah, you know, yeah. And, and, but the, it was interesting that they, and maybe they were pretend, like pretending not to recognize me. But, but <laughs> They're like, kept walking as fast as they could. Kept walking. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, that gave, for better or worse, like, you know, that maybe took some of the intense human interaction down a notch. And, and then I, I had lunch with a friend 
who said that a friend of hers call, called all of the human interactions peopling, that there was too much peopling. <laughs> it's just <laughs> exhausting, all of the peopling. Yeah. So there was a lot of peopling. Well, those meetings tend to be that way, right? Like it's always a complaint of the large annual meetings. Like there's just so right. many people. Yeah. Right. Um, attendance was down. <laughs> okay. I would assume. How much down do you think? It, it was strange. Maybe you could help me think through this. In the hall, like the hallways of the convention center, it felt down by maybe 75%. Like there were not throngs of people like rushing from one room to, you know, conference right. room to another. Yeah. But in the sessions, it felt more like it was maybe 30 to 50% down. Um, and I don't know. So there were like 150 at one of one of the talks, the sessions that I gave a talk in and 75 at another. So I was kind of surprised by that. And it, it, was much better to speak to an actual audience than a largely empty room. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm used to speaking to largely empty rooms. Largely. That's just because, <laughs> like, the, you know, not many this, my, people don't go to my session. Yeah. People don't go to your sessions. Um, yes, yeah, so that was pleasant. Um, I've forgotten about how there's a meeting app. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I like, I think it's my generation where like the, the, the meeting app, like when I first started going to this meeting was in the early two thousands, there was no meeting app and the meeting app has been around for a few years, but I just like, it had flown out of my mind that this thing existed. Yeah. Anyway. So there's a meeting app and you know, it was updated. It was actually quite useful. Okay. Look at that. <laughs> I've forgotten about the crap that gets hung on your doorknob of your hotel room. Mm. Do, do, do you know about this? No, I'm not. I don't, I don't think I do. I think this happens at like medical professional societies because they're all like the ads from the, so you, you wake up in the morning and you open your hotel room to go to your thing. And there's like a plastic bag that has, you know, invitations to some booth in the exhibit oh, hall. And wow. Okay. It's just a bunch of. That doesn't happen at our meetings. I right? just throw that stuff out. I imagine, yeah. <laughs> but I, I've forgotten about that. And I guess the only other thing was sort of how that was interesting was the, like the, they had to be very flexible or they made a decision to be very flexible of, because of COVID. And so it was a hybrid meeting. So there's some sessions that I think it were purely virtual and pre-recorded. There were some live sessions that were available, you know, synchronously and virtually. And then there are a lot of in-person sessions that are not available virtually. The first session I spoke in, one of the speakers was coming from Boston and her flight got canceled. And so she had a pre-recorded talk. Um, and so two of the talks were live and in person and she gave a pre-recorded talk and it's definitely not nearly, I mean, it's no surprise, not nearly as engaging, like the, to have the audience sit there and listen to a pre-recorded talk. Yeah. Yeah. The second session I gave a talk in, all of the speakers were there. And so that went normally. And then a session I moderated that was supposed to have five abstracts and there were two no-shows. One person no-showed because they had COVID. Okay, good reason. That person had not ne had not pre-recorded their abstract presentation. So as a moderator, I just sort of, you know, at the beginning announced that we would be skipping it. The other person who wasn't there may have been someone who was from another country and had pre-recorded the talk and I don't know why I thought to do this, but I actually tried to play it like right before the session and the audio was all garbled. Oh. And so we just had to, so I had to make like a game time call. <laughs> so we had no, so we only had three abstracts. Well, uh, let me ask you a question. So are when something like this happens, are you allowed to just skip over that person and go to the next one? That's what I did. I mean, I, I, I was just saying at our meetings, we we can't do that. You d we just have to wait um, until that person's slot is done, and then and then we can go to the next person. 
And and I can see why that is because because there are people who are like moving from room to room and they think, well, this abstract isn't starting until this time. Right. And I think under normal circumstances, <laughs> I might have done that. Right. But as I said to one of my co-moderators, not in, in another session, which I will describe, I was like, we should be getting hazard pay for this. Totally. Like the, the, like the level of sort of like, you know, game time decision making placed on a moderator who's just like signed up and volunteered to moderate that session. Right. <laughs> and the level of like tech stuff that was required, you know, that had to go smoothly was like mind boggling. Yeah. And so I just took matters and, and, and the meeting was not well attended. So I was like, all right, uh, this is what I'm going to do, as I said. And, and I wasn't even sure whether all the speakers are there. So at the beginning of the session, I, I had identified three of them, but I didn't want to miss the other two. So I asked all the speakers to raise their hands <laughs> to confirm that there were really only three there. And then I said, we only have three abstracts that are being presented. And um, the good news is we'll have more time for discussion. And was there plenty of discussion? There was plenty of discussion. I think it ended a little bit early, but... Um, okay. The other thing that happens, of course, is like there are people in the audience who, well, our field is pretty small. And as people get further and further along in their careers, there's here's a, a honest or a non-ironic leadership sort of insight. People become leaders in their field and they're in the audience and they're going to help you as the moderator also make sure there's discussion going on and their questions being answered. Right. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Um, and so I, it would have been very stressful had I been early in my career and had to like moderate that session and make those sorts of decisions. Right. Yeah. But it was, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, really that big of a deal. And like I said, there are people in the audience who are helping out. And then the last session that I moderated, uh, there were three talks and the first two were pre-recorded. <laughs> okay. The people who pre-recorded them were zoomed in, but just on audio because they were supposed to be available to answer questions. Oh, oh okay. And the talks had audience response questions embedded in them that people were supposed to answer through an app. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I've seen this in live talks. Yes. Yeah, so it works okay. I mean, it, it's they've worked out the kinks in live talks, but so you could imagine introducing the session and the speaker, and then hitting play, <laughs> and then everyone sits down. Yeah, and then we had to manually pause the video when it got to the slide with the audience response questions because it didn't have like normally. There's a special slide that comes up in a PowerPoint mode that will, and so the questions were not loading into the app the audience response section in the app. Okay. You know, so it was, that was a bit of a flail. But then, and then how does the speaker like respond to, like, I thought the whole point of those things is that the speaker can then like see the data and then like respond to it. Right. It, there was, it was not clear to me. Okay. Like, <laughs> I, I don't really know exactly. Right. And each, each talk that worked differently, you know. Um, yeah. So then the other thing you can't do is you can't, as a moderator, tell people to hurry up because they've like pre-recorded their talk. Right. Yeah. You can't flash the sign. So then, you know, and then uh, uh, people don't know whether to clap or not when the pre-recorded <laughs> yeah, talk is That is over. awkward. Yeah. So then as the moderator, you're like, you know, clapping to try to tell people to clap. The second talk was pre-recorded and we decided not to do Q&A after each talk, even though the pre-recorded speakers were like there virtually because we were afraid of time. And then we had the person speak the, the, in, the, the in person was the third speaker and she did the audience response questions. They, they all worked out just fine. And then, then, um, then we had some Q&A. And then it was over. But that was the one where there was a lot going on. Yeah, it sounds like it. And it uh, sounds like you managed it perfectly, though. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and another one that I was in where the speaker in and the moderator was needing to pull up the video 
the moderator could only find the PowerPoint, you know, so there's uh-huh. like a PowerPoint, but no speaker. Uh-huh. <laughs> I actually just went up on the dais and figured it out. And that's the leadership thing. At some point in time, like you've, you've done it for so long. You're like, I have no qualms just walking up there and yeah. <laughs> figuring Taking it over. out. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's it. That was a lot. Yeah. Well, you know, it was, it was all news to me because I haven't been to a meeting at all. Um, so, it, you know, the whole, everything is new to me now. Well, I recommend it was good. I was only there for 36 hours. It was, it was plenty of time. It was plenty of time. And it wasn't, like I said, like I was in bed by 11 Friday night and Saturday night. Like it was not, you know, late night gabbing with people or bar <laughs> hopping or something like that. And I was still completely spent. I don't think I would have spent more than 36 hours at a meeting in the past. So uh, that seems like you're okay. Well then, oh, then okay. maybe you need to cut yours down to 24 hours. Like, that's true. Like it's, it's... Yeah. <laughs> Anything else on the meeting? No, I think that unless you have questions, that was poorly <laughs> organized. That was sort of like this vomit. And you didn't have any audience response questions for me. No, <laughs> no. All right. One more we have one more topic, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this won't take very long. I, I just wanted to, I was talking to my colleague, Stephanie Hicks, early, early this morning, also friend of the show. And uh, she was talking about building your brand as a scientist. She claimed that we had talked about this before, but I could not recall when <laughs> or who said what. Um, I mean, it sounds like something we would have talked about, but. I have no memory of anything. I don't either, which, which by the way, so word was that I was very down on building a brand. But neither of us could remember that. So like, who knows if it actually happened, right? Well, this also tells you that we're out here spewing advice that we ourselves can't even remember. So. Right. <laughs> Probably don't follow. Yes. Yeah. Just, just to, that's sort of a caveat for the listeners out there. <laughs> Well, anyway, I, I thought it's just I think it's a good topic. First of all, I should say Stephanie wrote a nice blog post about this, uh, which I will link to in the show notes. That's kind of the main reason I wanted to mention it, because there is actually some good advice in there. Um, and I also wanted and I think one of the key things that is worth remembering and that she writes about in the blog post is that your brand kind of happens whether you like it or not. <laughs> Like whether you do anything about it or not, right? Right. Um, and I and I thought about like you know what's the difference between like a person's quote unquote brand and their reputation, right? And um, I don't know, do you think those are the same word? You know, I I see this written down, and I I love this because I think they are related, but not one and the same. And I hugely endorse. Um, the nurturing and cultivating of one's reputation. But I think that that's a little bit different than brand. Okay. And I, and you're saying, okay, cause you want me to say how they're different. Yes. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to, we can wait. Uh, <laughs> no, but... no, no. I'm just sort of trying to think about it. Like, um, so I have a reputation as a closer, right? Amongst some. Yes. Amongst some. And I think, I think brand help me with this because I am going to, I'm going to say some things about it and you'll be able to synthesize it into like, I think of brand as like almost like someone who has like a tagline and it's more about deliberately marketing themselves as, you know, having a shtick almost. (laughs) Yeah. Which is different than, well, you know, this person's reputation is they're, you know, a really hard worker, um, very reliable, you know, not super creative or something like that. Like, that's different than um, this person's brand is that they're, they're the leading speaker on climate, ch- you know, the, the leading voice on climate change science. Okay. Is, is, am I making any sense or not really? I think so. I, I, I think for me to make a crude dichotomization, you know, I, I feel like your reputation is something that kind of happens to you. 
uh, and your brand is something that is actively that you actively try to kind of manage. Oh, uh, I might disagree with that. Okay, well, I mean, I, 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 that's why I said it was a crude dichotomization. I think that like the the active elements, like you can think about your reputation and actively try to manage it, right? I think that's fine. I think many people do not, though. And um, and so the reputation is developed based on just like whatever happens to kind of like reach the public or reach the community, right? What, the scientific community, that is. Um, so you publish a paper, you give a talk at a meeting, you, I don't know, do whatever, what, your normal output as an academic. And then whatever happens to hit the community is what people use to, you know, to to determine your who you are and what your reputation is, right? Right. I mean, what other information is there, right? Unless they personally know you, right? Um, and so that's one strategy. And I think many people, <laughs> probably the majority strategy, I would say, uh, people to kind of like produce their re- regular scholarly output and then uh, and then hope for the best. And I think her, her point is that you can take an active role and, and to try to manage kind of what is out there and I think part of the issue is that there are just way more tools now, right? Like I think 20 years ago, you published a paper, you gave a talk. That was kind of it. Maybe you had a blog. I mean, that was kind of new back then. Um, but um, and uh, maybe you talked to a reporter, you know, like <laughs> once in a while. And uh, there weren't that many tools or outlets, right? Uh, and now there are like a lot of tools and a lot of outlets. Um, and so the question is, wh- what do you do with that? if anything, right? I think, so I think there are a lot of, um, so there, you can try to, I think you and I agree that like you can try to manage this perception of who you are um, and not just let, let the chips just fall where they may, right? Yes. I think, I think it's important to think about that. And as you're talking, I think that maybe my distinction between brand and reputation, which is, I I don't know at all that this is sort of the right way to view it. I think of brand as sort of your public facing reputation. And I I think what I mean by that is like, as I hear you talking about Stephanie mentioning all these different platforms or when you talk to a reporter, whereas I think of reputation, my reputation is sort of like, what do I want to be? What do you, what do I want my reputation to be among like, like my community, which is different than sort of this public, larger platform, public facing reputation. Ah, I see. So you make a distinction there. And may, and I, well, I'm just articulating it now because I don't think that I thought about it explicitly in that way. But I think of brand as sort of like, okay, I want to develop this brand so that, you know, I have 50,000 Twitter followers and Um, they come to me as the person to follow about, um, you know, information about this particular issue. Whereas I think about my reputation as what is it that people who collaborate with me or who are one degree removed from that, or um, what is it that they think of me as someone to kind of work with and, um, it, it kind of, you know, in all aspects, like what's my, so one is more local is not the right word, right? One is much more larger scale in terms of audience in my mind, but I, I've just made that up. Yeah. Well, I think it's worth in kind of emphasizing what you just said was that there, like there are different communities and different kind of groups of people. Um, and you have to think about like who you're going to be in each of those communities. Right. Uh, and I think one of the things that I think the most important thing that Stephanie writes in her blog post is that thinking about this, the beneficial thing of, of, of thinking along these lines is that it forces you to ask yourself like who you are. And it maybe I would say who you are in a given community um, and whether people in that community see you that way. Um, because I could say I'm a machine learning expert, right? Uh, but if nobody in the community <laughs> thinks of me that way, then there's a gap, right? right and it might right. just be because I'm not <laughs> a machine learning expert, expert, or because like I haven't put out the kinds of you know output that would cause that to occur. And so, either way, you have to figure out what the gap is and how to narrow it, how to close it. Um, and um, and so I think thinking about who you think you are, who do you want to be. Um, uh, is is an important activity, and I don't think many people do that. I think that people kind of 
many people just kind of produce their output and just assume that other people, well, because I wrote this paper, everyone knows that I'm an expert and whatever, you know? Um, and, uh, I, that's not always true. I, I mean, it's many often not true. Right. Right. Uh, I mean, many people don't under, know about my work with puppets, you know, it's just, uh, <laughs> you know, you're not cultivating that brand sufficiently. Exactly. Right. Your so puppet brand. they just think I'm a statistician, you know? So I think to, to maybe it's generalize this kind of idea is just that like, you want to make sure that the person that you think you are, and assuming you know who, who you want to be, which is a big right. assumption, right? right. It's a very big assumption. But assuming you know who you want to be, you have to make sure that the person you think you are is what other people kind of think you are too. This makes me think of, um, I was, before I moved to Texas, I was talking to a really good friend of mine who's in, still based in Baltimore. And she's a very savvy sort of HR person. And she said to me, well, you're moving, so now's a good time to ask yourself what you want your reputation to be in your new environment. Yeah. And that question, on the one hand, was so obvious. On the other hand, it blew me away. It, it, and it led me to sort of say, okay, what, what do I want people in my – this is, again, a different audience. What, what do I want people – to uh, what do I want the rumor mill to be about me? Right. Um, yeah, that's and, one way to think about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do you want the rumor mill to be? Um, because you have control over that. Right. And some control. Um, yes. Yeah, you do. I mean, I, th I think, I think you do have, I think you have a fair amount of control, right? Like yeah. if people, if you develop a reputation that, Oh, she's so helpful and I feel really good about, you know, the direction I'm going after I meet with her or that goes a long way. And, um, when you, you know, change institutions or make other changes, um, you, it's hard to reset the, that reputation once it's been established. Right. Yeah. All right. I'm looking forward to reading her blog post. Okay. Weekly grind. Yes. You go. F uh, mine is the quad AI meeting, so you, I have yeah. You had a big. Uh, you had a big week. I had the opposite, actually. I had um, just like the most regular kind of two weeks I could think of. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you tell me what activity would you like to hear? I did. I um, I met with a student. I saw. I met with a student, and I saw a thesis defense actually. Fantastic. There you go. That's good when things are regular. Yeah, I guess that's right. Yeah, think about it. Yeah, maybe things really are trending towards regular. Yeah, don't jinx it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so you, th I think that's a wrap. You can find us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at The Effort Report, and you can also email us. Our email address is theeffortreport at gmail.com. Thanks, everybody, for listening. <laughs>